All right, welcome to another exciting edition of Painting of the Week. And this week we are going to be looking at Oedipus explaining the Enigma of the Sphinx by the French painter Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre. And this is an excellent example of neoclassicism, and that brings me to the first thing that I want to talk about is a lot of people, even people who haven't studied art, know that there were different art movements or different periods like Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, um, Cubism, and one of the things that people always ask me is, well, like looking at a painting like this, how do you know that it's neoclassicism? And there's a few different things that you can uh, sort of learn or teach yourself to be able to discern what art movement a particular painting is from. The simplest way is just to look at the painter. So Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre, uh, as I said, was a French painter. But I, you just know, if you study artists, you would know that Angre is a neoclassicist just because that was the type during the time period in which he painted and his uh, artistic style, he was a neoclassicist by definition. So the first thing you should always look at is who the artist is. The next thing you should look at is the date when the uh, particular piece was painted. So neoclassicism has a very uh, distinct time period uh, that it falls into, as do all art movements. Well, I shouldn't say distinct. It's kind of nebulous sometimes as to when one art period starts and when another ends. But the, the time during which something was painted is another good hint. And then the third thing you should be looking at is the subject matter of the painting. And this painting depicts Oedipus. And the reason I picked this painting this week is because in <laughs> some of my friends in um, AP Literature and Composition back at Central High School, where I, uh, where I went to high school, they were writing literary reductions for Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. And for those of you who don't know, I, I'm assuming you have some hopefully familiarity with the Oedipus stories or the Oedipus legend, but just to give you a brief summary, Oedipus was the son of Laos and Yakista, who were king and queen of Thebes. And when they consulted the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, um, the oracle prophesied that their son would kill Laos, his his um, would kill his father, Laos, and then marry his mother, Yakista. Anyway, so when they did have a son, uh, they actually they pinned his ankles together so that he couldn't crawl, and then they had a servant leave him out on a nearby mountain to die of exposure. But then the servant felt bad, and rather than leave the child out there just to die as was intended, that sympathetic servant passed the baby on to a shepherd from Corinth, and then to another shepherd, and he eventually um, ended up coming to the house of Polybus, who was the king of Corinth, and the queen, Merope, who adopted Oedipus as their own child and raised him. And you can read the rest. Actually, if you go on Wikipedia and just type in Oedipus, there's an excellent summary of the story. Um, but that that's kind of how it all begins. And actually, Oedipus is Greek for swollen foot, which of course, refers to the uh, the nail or the spike that was driven into Oedipus's ankles when he was a baby to try to prevent him from being able to crawl away. Anyway, so this is a Greek story. It's a story from ancient Greece, which is another piece of evidence and support for this as a neoclassicist painting, is that it's depicting classical Greco-Roman type themes. So looking at the painting now, there's a steep kind of rocky landscape, and you can see Oedipus, who's naked. He's in profile, and he's facing the Sphinx. And the Sphinx is a monster, and Angra has depainted the Sphinx as a um, as having the face, the head, and the shoulders of a woman with a lion's body, and then the wings of a bird. And she's sort of standing out in the shadows. And what Oedipus is doing is he's giving the solution to the riddle that the Sphinx has asked him, and asks all travelers who pass through uh, this particular region of, of Thebes. And just to get back to the Oedipus story a little bit more, um, just so you can make some sense of this painting, when Oedipus himself um, came into contact with the Delphic Oracle of Apollo, the Oracle told him that the prophecy that he was going to uh, kill his father and marry his mother, just like Laos and Yakista had been when told before Oedipus was born. And when he hears that, he flees Corinth because he's concerned about 
who he thinks are his real parents, Polly, Bruce, and Merope. He doesn't know that he's adopted. And tragically, <laughs> where does he end up fleeing to? He flees to Thebes, where his real parents are. And on the way there, he encounters a, a traveler, and they argue about who has the, the right of way to cross the road first, and he ends up killing the traveler, and that man ended up being Laos, his father. So the first half of the prophecy is fulfilled. But what happens is, on his way to Thebes, there was the Sphinx, and the Sphinx terrorized Thebes and kind of held the whole city under siege. And what she or it would do was ask a riddle that no one had been able to solve before. And the riddle was, what is it that has a voice and walks on four legs in the morning, on two at noon, and then on three in the evening? And you can see the fate of, of what's happened to all those uh, unfortunate travelers who had not been able to answer the riddle. You can see kind of a uh, foot, <laughs> just a discarded foot there in the bottom left-hand corner of the painting, and a human skeleton. But Oedipus, on the other hand, he's giving the reply to the Sphinx, and he reasoned that the answer was man, who crawls on all fours as a child, right? Like in the morning, as an adult, will walk on two legs, adulthood being synonymous with the afternoon, and then in the evening, or old age, uses a cane or a stick as a third leg. And then upon, uh, when, when Oedipus beat the Sphinx, the Sphinx destroyed herself, and then Thebes was freed from her captivity. So when Oedipus then came into Thebes, he was a hero, and he was given in marriage the recently widowed queen of Thebes, Yakasta, who was his mother. So then the prophecy was fulfilled. Oedipus had killed his father, and he had married his mother, and he still doesn't know it. And um, if you go on and read Oedipus Rex by Sophocles or any of the other uh, tales about Oedipus, um, then, then you know how it ends. Um, <laughs> but getting back now specifically just to looking at the piece, um, there's, some, there's one other detail that I should point out in the background. You can see one of Oedipus's fellow travelers who's fleeing in terror. And then you can also see kind of the hazy outline of the city of Thebes in the background in that kind of uh, opening on the other side of this crevasse that Oedipus is standing in. And the theme of this work, and this is from the Louvre website, which actually has a lot of great information about all the paintings there, and this, this is a painting that's in the Louvre. Um, the theme is the, the triumph of intelligence and also of human beauty, if you look at the way that Oedipus is depicted. But once again, also, since this relates back to the Oedipus tale, it's also a scene of man confronting his destiny, right? He was destined to beat the Sphinx, and while at the time that was a tremendous accomplishment, it ultimately led to um, to his demise um, and the fulfillment of that unfortunate prophecy. But beyond that, beyond the implications of that, this is just a depiction of the triumph of man and human reason over a monster. And getting a little bit more into the history now, this was painted in 1808, and it was Angro's first, what was called a dispatch from Rome. And it was simply a, a figure study, or what was called an academy figure. And it was a type of painting that everyone had to do if they were going to be studying at the French Academy in Rome. Because Angro was a French painter, but he was studying in Rome. So he painted this, um, this painting, and it was then sent to Paris, that were, it, in, where it would be judged by the members of the Institute um, in France, and they actually criticized the painting um, quite heavily. <laughs> but there's also a muted use of chiaroscuro, and I've used that term now in, I think, almost every painting <laughs> of the week we've done thus far. But once again, just as a reminder, chiaroscuro is um, kind of a, a contrast in, in areas of light and shade, so you can see how Oedipus is given this kind of brilliance, this almost like there's a lot of, like, there's a spotlight directed on him, whereas the background particularly, um, the cave in which the Sphinx is standing, and the Sphinx herself is very dark. So that's um, kind of a muted use of chiaroscuro that Angra has incorporated into this painting. And that was one of the things that the Institute criticized, was the kind of subdued chiaroscuro of Oedipus. One thing that's very important in Neoclassic's painting is um, the kind of archaic flavor that it has, because it's supposed to be making reference to um, kind of the, the pieces of art and architecture that we would have seen in Greece and Rome back in the, uh, the time when those ancient civilizations were flourishing. And in 1827, Angra returned to this painting after it had been criticized by the Institute, 
and he actually extended the canvas on three sides so that he could make the Sphinx larger, and he toned down a lot of the archaicism, and he gave it a more modern, even kind of a more romantic appearance. And he also made certain sections darker, so kind of heightening, once again, that chiaroscuro effect, and he also added the, the figure in the background. Alright, thanks for listening to this slightly longer than average video, and we'll see you again next week.